Good morning, and God bless you all. And welcome, and welcome to all of you online, and Merry Christmas. I don't know, it always felt weird for me to say Merry Christmas, you know, before Christmas, but really it is, it is the Advent season, and so uh, I, I've had to learn that it's okay and it helps us anticipate uh, the, the very presence of God and the reason that we celebrate this season. So um, for, if I haven't met you, my name is Randall Wing, I'm one of the pastors here, and uh, we are continuing in this Advent series. God with us. And as Pastor Hector said last week, the really the inspiration for this series came from our missions month in October when many of our, our global partners were speaking to us. And, and I just want to tell you that, that um, I don't take these relationships with our global partners lightly. Um, many of them we have partnered with for decades. And and a, a number of years ago, God had put it on our heart to uh, really press into those relationships, that, that he had something more for us, that it wasn't us just supporting our missionaries, that there was uh, something in the relationship that he was doing in, in both of us. And so I always look forward to hearing from our global partners because I expect to hear something of the prophetic voice of God speaking through them to us. And so uh, during that time, they were speaking to us, and, and one of those things that was coming up was just, well, obviously about uh, the gospel and discipleship, um, but about the very presence of God, about the witness of God, and how discipleship is really made up of uh, intimate relationships that are pressing into uh, intimacy with the living God. And so um, I'm just grateful for these global partners. And, and I feel like, you know, this series comes out of the, those relationships. Um, his witness, God's witness with us in the unseemly places of our lives bears witness to his love and his gentle patience to lead us to a place of wholeness and healing and belonging. Let, let's, I'm going to stop here and just pray. Heavenly Father, thank you that you are a God of relationship. The very Trinity is a community of, of intimate, loving relationship. And your creation of us was an expansion of that community. And sin came and blew it all apart. And you have been working throughout history to restore that relationship so that we could enjoy the community of God. And so I pray today that we would attune our ears to the voice of the Spirit and hear your call, not only to intimacy, but, but to the very mission of God to restore all things, to restore all of creation. And so we bless you today. I pray your blessing on all of your people today, on our community here, that we would grow and know what it is to truly love one another. In Jesus' name, amen. So I want to give you just a quick illustration personal illustration of, of withness that I've experienced in my life. And I, I'm pretty sure I've shared it here before, so I won't go into great detail, just a, a highlight here. But Barry Olson was a, a man who uh, really played a significant role in my life. He was a friend and a mentor. And he spoke into my life when I was too caught up 
in my circumstances, too caught up in the, in the pressures and the stresses of life to, to see that I was not in a healthy place and something needed to change in my life. And Barry came along and, and he was close enough to see what I couldn't see. He was caring enough to speak into my life in a way that I could receive an unpleasant truth. And he was generous enough to invest his time and his resources to help me make the changes that I needed to make. So Barry was, was a man, a mentor, a friend, who valued me enough to be with me during a critical point in my journey of faith. Now Barry has gone to be with the Lord, but my life will never be the same because of the withness that Barry demonstrated in my life. So withness is our witness, not just for the unbelieving world, but among us as we take time to really get to know each other and walk with each other through the difficult times. It's Jesus speaking into our lives and calling us into a deeper trust, a deeper faith, a deeper intimacy, into the, really the very heart and generosity of God. And so in a very real sense, we are a gift that God gives to one another. And, and we need to value that and make all of it that we can make of it. So, witness is a word that you're going to hear throughout this month. Witness refers to God being with us, and us being with God, and us being with others for God. In Jesus' discipleship model, he demonstrates the principles of witness. Witness is being with people, imparting your life, your character, your faith for our mutual benefit. And it requires risk and vulnerability. <laughs> requires us to open our hearts when maybe we've been hurt and, and we've closed in for a time. We're not trusting. We don't want to be hurt again. But it requires us to begin to open our hearts, trusting that God is doing something. It requires us to be available in both ways to one another. So discipleship, according to Jesus' model, is being with people, sharing our lives, and, and willingness to go deep. It's not just relationship for the sake of relationship, but it's guided by God's mission for Jesus to reconcile and restore all of creation from its fallen state. We're part of that. The Father sent Jesus to be with us, to show us the Father, and model for us how to be with God and with each other in genuine love. Witness is the means to the end of restoration and reconciliation of mankind with God. I'm going to say that again. It may not make sense on the surface, but, but trust me, their witness is the means to the end of restoration and reconciliation of mankind with God. Jesus didn't just come to be with us. He's training us to be with each other. That is part of Jesus' mission and the reconciliation of all creation. Our witness to the world requires withness not just words. I might as well leave that cap off. <laughs> okay, so this is the, the theme verse, verse for this series from Matthew, and Matthew is quoting from the prophet Isaiah um, in Isaiah 7.14, and Isaiah lived about 700 years before Jesus was born. And he prophesied this, Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. 
And last week, Pastor Hector laid the foundation for this series, God With Us, by sharing the story of the Incarnation and the historical background and prophecies concerning Jesus' coming. Um, for the that message, I want to encourage you to go and listen to it. Uh, it's available on our website. And so we observe Advent, this season of Christmas, each year to remember how Jesus visited us, visited us the first time to deliver us from the bondage of sin and from the devil. He died for our sins, taking our sins upon himself, and God raised him from the dead because he was without sin. Through his death, we are forgiven, and through his resurrection, we have eternal life. But we also retell the Christmas story to renew our hope that Jesus has promised to come again, to restore all things, and to bring justice and righteousness back to God's creation. So this world, with all of its evil, the corruption, the death that, that, that seems to be getting worse every day, can be discouraging for us. And it's helpful, for, for me at least, at least in the midst of the chaos, to keep my eyes on the promises yet to be fulfilled and are the culmination of the work that God has begun in Christ. And so, uh, as I begin this message, I want to give you a, a glimpse of the end of the story, and then we'll come back and, and look at the earlier parts of the story. So, a glimpse of the story, the end of the story, from a heavenly perspective. At the end of the age... When the corruption of Satan, sin, sickness, and death are destroyed. When all rebellion has been put down and God's righteous rule and reign are restored over all creation. The Apostle Paul is telling us in this passage from 1 Corinthians 15 what has been accomplished by the death and resurrection of Jesus. He says, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep, that is, died. First fruits just means that Jesus is the first one of all creation that has conquered death. He has overcome death. So Christ, the first fruits. For by man, Adam, death came, came death, and by a man, Jesus, has come also the resurrection from the dead. For as, as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in its own order. Christ, the firstfruits. Then at his second coming, those who belong to Christ. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power. And so, in Christ's first coming, he purchased our salvation. At his second coming, we will be made alive forever in Christ. And he goes on to say, For he must rule, or he must reign, until he has put all enemies under his feet. The last enemy to be destroyed is death. For God has put all things in subjection under his feet. And so, just to summarize that, that short passage, sin, through Adam, the first human, brought death. Christ's sinless life, offered on the cross, paid the penalty for our sin. His resurrection defeated death and opens the way for our resurrection from the dead through faith in Him. Christ is presently, presently reigning from his throne in heaven, and working through his church to assault the kingdom of darkness and rescue souls. And so Jesus is, has not stopped working. He sits on his throne in heaven, exercising royal authority. Jesus' mission on behalf of the Father is to deliver the kingdom, God's original creation marred by rebellion, destruction, and death to restore that back to the Father. 
And so Jesus is still on mission for his father. His job is not yet done. Jesus' only provision for his continued work on earth is the church full of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to say that again because that's really important. Jesus' only provision for his continued work on earth is the church full of the Holy Spirit. That's you, and that's me. Jesus continues to shine his light in the darkness through the church. However, I'm going to have you stand up for, for just a moment. However insignificant we may feel at times, I assure you, we are not insignificant when we simply walk in the light of Christ, stand against the lies of the devil, and declare the name of Jesus as the way of salvation. That is what we do in the world. And we can't stop doing that. You can go ahead and, and sit down. So, I'm going to come back to that uh, scripture that, that was in the middle there. Then comes the end. When he delivers the kingdom to God the Father after destroying every rule and every authority and power, and I'll add, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. This is the end of the story. Jesus is putting down the rebellion of Satan. He is reclaiming the creation that was subjected, subjugated and destroyed by Satan and returning it back under the righteous rule and reign of the Father. Jesus' mission to redeem and restore all of creation is an act of love for his Father. Do you, do you, can you envision this picture? The end of the age has come. Jesus has defeated all of the Father's foe. The last foe to be destroyed is death. And Jesus rises from his throne and he and he takes this, this package, this completed package, and he hands it back to the Father. Can you see that? He's saying, it's done, Father. It's all back under your rule and reign. My job is completed. And he is doing this through the means of witness. The Father is with Jesus. Jesus was sent from the Father to earth to be with us, experiencing our suffering and suffering for us to redeem us from the bondage to sin and Satan. And so now we'll go back to the time where Jesus was put to death, buried in the grave, and on the third day, raised from the dead, victorious. He has accomplished the first part of his mission. And he comes to his disciples, and he says this, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples and I will be with you always to the end of the age. And what happens at the end of the age? He delivers the kingdom back to the Father. Now I want to give you a, a little word picture that just occurred to me this morning. So we're in the Christmas season. Jesus delights to do the Father's will, to please Him. And His goal is to reunite the lost kingdom and hand it back to His Father. Right? And it occurs to me, so Jesus just gave us a command. Go therefore, make disciples, and I will be with you always to the end of the age. And what that kind of 
reminds me of. It's, it's kind of like this. You have a family, and they're celebrating Christmas. And you have, you know, the husband and the wife and the kids. And the kids want to do something really great for Dad. They don't know what it is, but they want to give Dad a gift, right? <laughs> and, and, the, and the mom, and of course, the kids don't have any money. And they don't even really know what Dad wants. Um, but Mom says, I got an idea. I know, I know the perfect gift. I know exactly what Dad will want. And so Mom, I'm going to go back and, and, and say, Jesus accomplished his part by giving his very life. He paid for it with his life. And so back in this, this illustration, mom goes out and she, she knows the perfect gift, but she doesn't have the money for it all too. So she has to make a great personal sacrifice in order to purchase that gift for dad. So mom does that. The kids don't even know how, you know, how much it cost mom, right, to buy this gift. They're just enjoying, they love to get gifts, and now maybe they're learning to, to give gifts, but they, they don't really have the understanding. Mom comes home, and she has the gift that, that cost her a lot. And she brings it in the house, and she says, kids, you're not going to believe it. I am so excited. Look what we're getting, Dad. Right? But you got to help me wrap it. And so, but the kids can't, don't even know how to wrap. <laughs> right? And so Mom kind of brings the kids around and gets them involved in the project. And she, she wraps it and makes the nice corners and everything. And she says, you know, but you got to put the tape on. Put, and each one of you has to put on your tape. And, you know, here, stick it right there. And you know, you put one right here, and you put one right here, and so pretty soon they have this beautifully wrapped package, and it's got a beautiful bow on it. And now mom fills out a tag, and the tag says, for dad, from all of us. For dad, from all of us. And that's what Jesus is doing. Jesus went out and paid for the gift that he's giving to dad. And he says, but you got to help me wrap it. This is going to be from all of us. We each have to do our tiny part. But in the end, Jesus hands the kingdom back to his father. And he says, look, dad, what we got you the thing that, you, that will please you more than anything else in the world, and it's from all of us. He has sent us out in the same manner to those who remain in darkness to lead them to the light. Jesus is with us as we go out into the world in his name. So now that we've looked at the sort of the end of the story, let's go back to the beginning of Jesus' earthly ministry and see how he has been truly with us. At the birth of John the Baptist, uh, John the Baptist was the forerunner prophesied to go before Jesus and prepare the way for him. When John the Baptist was just born, his father, Zechariah, was filled with the Holy Spirit and he prophesied saying, Blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David. Jesus is the descendant of King David, as prophesied in the Bible. And Zechariah continues his prophecy, and he says, And you, child, speaking of John the Baptist, will be called the prophet of the Most High. For you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people, in the forgiveness of their sins, because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high, to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, to guide our feet into the way of peace. So Jesus came 
to be with us in the world's darkness as a guiding light to show us the way of peace. So if the world seems dark and getting darker, we shouldn't be discouraged. It's for this purpose that Jesus came into the world to guide us into the way of peace. We should expect darkness. Darkness should not cause us to cower in fear or to hide out. If we hide, we remain in darkness. The light presses into the darkness. Jesus told us, I am the light of the world. But he didn't stop there. Then he said, you are the light of the world. We are to be light bringers to those in darkness. And so how did Jesus give light to those in darkness to guide our feet into the way of peace? So the great apostle Peter, when he preaches to the Gentiles for the first time, and and I'll just remind you um, that the Jews mistakenly thought that they were the chosen people of God and that salvation was for them. That the Gentiles, most of you and I here, were not eligible for salvation. We were unclean. The Spirit of God told Peter to go and respond to an invitation to preach to Gentiles for the first time. And I want to what I want to point out to you, I'm going, to, I'm going to read his speech. It's short, don't worry. But notice, <clears throat> these are not eloquent words. He simply told what Jesus did. And so the, the background here, before I read this very short sermon, Cornelius was a Roman centurion, centurion and a devout man who feared God, though he wasn't He didn't know about the salvation of Jesus. He requested that Peter come to Caesarea to share the word of the Lord with them. And so Peter goes, and I don't know that I would do this, but really almost the first words out of Peter's mouth were, um, you know how it is unlawful for Jews to have fellowship with, you know, Gentiles, and we're not even allowed to come into your house. Um, But... Nevertheless, here I am. And he says, so Peter, Peter opened his mouth and said, truly, I understand that God shows no partiality, but in every nation, anyone who fears him and does what is right is acceptable to him. And he goes on, As for the word that he sent to Israel, preaching good news of peace through Jesus Christ, he is Lord of all, you yourselves know what happened throughout all Judea, beginning from Galilee, after the baptism that John proclaimed. And the the baptism that John the Baptist proclaimed at that time was a baptism for the repentance of sin. And he says, um, you, you know what John proclaimed, how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power. He went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed of the devil, for God was with him. They put him to death on a tr- uh, by hanging him on a tree, but God raised him on the third day and made him to appear to us who had been chosen by God as witnesses. That's most of the sermon. There's a little bit more. What did he say? What what did Jesus do? He went about doing good. Jesus went about doing good. To whom? To all, especially those who were oppressed by the devil. And, And how did he do it? Because God was with him. He was anointed by the Holy Spirit. Is God with us? Is God with you? Or do you want God to be with you? Jesus' work is not yet finished. He finished the salvation part on the cross. Now his work is what he is doing through his followers. 
God is with us when we do his work and his will. Like Jesus, whose desire is to do what pleases the Father, his Father, and our Father. So when we do what pleases the Father, he is with us. His Spirit strengthens and empowers us. And and this is the end of the message. He ended this very short message by telling them, and he commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one appointed by God to be judge of the living and the dead. To him all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Now I call this section of scripture just the simple gospel. It's not complicated. All he did was tell what what Jesus did. And I love this part because it's the next part of the passage says, while Peter was still talking, Peter wasn't done. And he and the other Jewish believers were, who were with him were surprised when the Holy Spirit interrupted his little speech, filling the Gentiles with his Holy Spirit, and they began to praise God and speak in tongues. I tell you, this is not what Peter was expecting. All the Jewish believers who were with Peter were amazed because the Holy Spirit fell on the Gentiles. And in response to this unexpected outpouring of the Spirit, Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. And so, I want to make it clear that until this time, Jews still thought Gentiles were unclean and not eligible to receive God's grace. And yet they received the same Holy Spirit that the Jewish believers had received. This was a challenge to all that Peter understood about God. To overcome his own prejudice and obey the Spirit's command to go and be with these unclean Gentiles. According to to Jewish teachings, Jews were not even allowed to set foot in a Gentile's home. Witness for the sake of Jesus required Peter to reevaluate his deeply held convictions and personal reputation. And so, as I mentioned, this was not an eloquent speech. The result was not because of Peter's speaking ability, but because of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit at hearing and retelling the the gospel story. This is recorded for us in Acts 10. I'm going to go back six chapters in Acts 4. Just after the, the fledgling church received the Holy Spirit. Peter and John having been filled with the Holy Spirit, healed a lame beggar and testified that Jesus, who had been killed and resurrected, had healed the lame man. They were arrested for teaching about Jesus' resurrection. Peter and John were being questioned by the religious leaders who were astonished because they perceived that, quote, these were uneducated and common men. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. The most notable thing about them was that it was obvious to all that these men had been with Jesus. This should be an encouragement to all of us who feel inadequate about sharing our faith. The key is not eloquence, but merely having spent time with Jesus enough to be changed by him. And we learn that our greatest asset is not our competence, but our reliance on the Holy Spirit. The same Spirit that empowered Jesus and whom Jesus gave to us all. Okay, so now we're going to look a little deeper into that principle of witness by looking at the ministry of Jesus. In Matthew chapter 15, Jesus went up on the mountain and sat down there. 
And great crowds came to him, bringing with them the lame, the blind, the crippled, the mute, and many others. And they put them at his feet. And he healed them so that the crowd wondered. And they glorified the God of Israel. Then Jesus called to his disciples, called his disciples to him, and said, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days. Can you imagine that? Word of Jesus visiting the area went out. People came from all over and they were so enthralled with what he was doing that they remained there three days and their food was gone. I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. I am unwilling to send them away hungry lest they faint along the way. And so this shows us the compassion of Jesus and his willingness to do something about it. And then Jesus goes on to perform another miracle of feeding the multitudes. Witness requires both compassion and a willingness to do something. Do something. Compassion means to suffer with. Jesus enters our suffering. Now we're talking about withness. A similar word to compassion, to suffer with, is the word companion. Companion means to accompany another. That's, that's a modern translation. But companion literally means with bread. It's to share a meal. It's to come alongside it and not just, you know, to, to, to eat with. Which is exactly what Jesus did here by doing a miracle of multiplying a small amount of food to feed the multitude because he had compassion on them. So as we're moving towards a conclusion, I have a few Reflection questions. Where might we have become hardened by the hardness of the world such that we find ourselves lacking in compassion? So I want to ask you, just take a moment in silence and ask yourself that question and see if anything rises to the surface. It may or it may not. Discipleship is the process by which Christ is formed in us. Is there something the Holy Spirit may be highlighting in your heart right now where Christ needs to be formed in you so that you are able to reflect the compassion of Christ to others? Perhaps say a silent prayer now about how you would like to respond to any prompting of the Holy Spirit. God did not come down into our darkness. I mean, He did not have to come down into our darkness. But He had compassion for us. He did not allow Himself to become hardened by all the evil in the world. The Apostle James tells us that religion that is pure and undefiled before God the Father is this, to visit orphans and widows in their affliction and to keep oneself unstained by the world. You know, it's hard living in this world and not becoming stained or hardened. Another question how might we have allowed ourselves to become, have become stained by the corrupting influences of the world? Is there something the Holy Spirit may be highlighting in your heart right now that you need to repent of, to stop doing, so that the Holy Spirit may move more freely and more powerfully in your life?
Perhaps say a prayer about how you would like to respond to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. We are called to share in Christ's mission, to share the good news and make disciples. Jesus shared the gospel by showing compassion under the leading and power of the Holy Spirit as a primary, primary vehicle for leading people into the way of peace. Withness. Withness is our witness. I'll close by just reminding us, you are the light of the world. Light moves into, that is, it invades the darkness. And the darkness cannot overcome it. As Jesus was the light of the world, he came into its darkness and we saw his light. He walked among us doing the work of the Father. And Jesus told his disciples, As the Father has sent me, even so I am sending you. Jesus came to be with us in our darkness and deliver us into his light. He's not abandoned us. And thank you, Isabella. I, I loved your sharing. He has not abandoned us, but sends us as light into the world's darkness. And his promise to us is, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I want to just thank you just for opening up our understanding to see a broader scope of what you're doing. The picture of the end of the age when, when Jesus restores the kingdom free of rebellion, sin, sickness, death. Back to you, the original creation, full of goodness. And he did that. Father, you instigated it. You sent the Son to be with us. And now you're inviting us to practice that presence, that witness within our families, within our church community, but, but also light pressing out into the darkness. May we be fully assured of your witness as we go out into the darkness. May it embolden us and give us confidence and strength to know that the, the, the darkness that we move into cannot overcome the light. And Father, we desire to join with our Savior Jesus in His work of restoring the kingdom. And we look forward to that day when, when Jesus, the King of kings, and the Lord of lords, returns, delivers that kingdom back to you under your righteous rule. We love you, Father. Thank you in Jesus' name.